Hello, I am Dr. Chloe Farahar of Academy, and I am joined today by Nicola Wakeling, who is one of our followers um, and also has a page called A Space for Difference on Facebook. And we kind of decided after Nicola was asking some really interesting and kind of pertinent questions on um, Harry Thompson's Facebook page to give Nicola the opportunity to ask questions that maybe lots of people have um, where we can give the opportunity to actually answer and give some evidence for the answers as well. So some basic things as well, um, like uh, how do we explain to a GP, for instance, that just because we can make eye contact um, doesn't mean we're not autistic. So yeah, so hello Nicola. <laughs> Hi Chloe, thank you for having me here. It's all right. And how did you want to view this session as well? Because we had a conversation offline, didn't we? That it's not that necessarily you don't know the answers to the questions you have. I kind mm. of feel like this is sort of like a useful tool where you might ask the questions that other people are likely to have. Yeah, absolutely. I think that I've found that over the years, my understanding has been changing and I'm learning more, but yet there's still a lot to learn. So I've been asking you and then I think when you said, and other people, when you said about doing the question and answer, I thought, well, I'm starting to have more of an understanding now, but it'd be really good to, to share that with more people and, and explore it further as well. Because even I think one of my main questions when you answered it, it made sense, but I think it's putting that into practice um you know and getting used to saying things in a different way i suppose i think my original question was asking about how else can you say about if you know if a child's high functioning um without those labels there were labels that i was aware that i wanted to drop that other people were using um and it made sense when you said to talk about needs okay so let's put that in practice and give some examples yeah and I think that's what people want a lot of the time, because I think these conversations and questions are being answered um, all over the place across the autistic community. Um, and sometimes I think the most important thing is, yeah, what are the practical things that you can actually do? Um, so that's quite a good way to look at it, I guess. Um, would you mind telling me a little bit about yourself um, so we can understand? Okay, so... be here. <laughs> yeah, well, I think my journey began in, I think it was... 2006, 2007, um, formally, I guess I was a special needs teacher. I worked in a special needs school um, and I was trained there in a way that I thought I, I knew the answers or I knew, you know, what autism was. Autism was just one of, you know, um, the, the types of children that we'd have at school. But um, yeah, I was trained to, to talk in a different way. Than now and going from working in special needs schools which I did for a few years my daughter was born in 2009 um, and that's where I think my education really changed or my understanding of autism um, but actually it wasn't really until she was eight years old so it's about two to three three years ago um, again I thought I knew what autism was what it looked like very stereotypical and had no ideas why I was having trouble with my daughter why we were facing such challenges and I worked with a coach um her name's B Marshall she was brilliant and I'd worked with her for a while and she said to me I think that your daughter's autistic and my initial thought was no okay. so yeah so for, so for me I thought I had an understanding of what autism looked like and that wasn't my daughter but she said to me just go and have a look at what it looks like in a female and that opened up a whole new world because I looked and it was like tick, 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 tick. And I got quite excited because I'd had eight years of not really understanding what we were struggling with and nobody listening to me. You know, it was always my parenting. I need more discipline, more boundaries, more structure, more rules. And I was struggling. So I did think it was me. Um, so that felt really reassuring and I ran straight to her Senko who'd known her, well the school Senko wasn't her Senko, who had known her since we'd moved here a few years before and then even she said no, she's very sociable, she's this, she's that, I said just look into it. She agreed and I think that was really spot on of, of B Marshall and it turned out that she got a diagnosis as well shortly after that as a female on the spectrum so it was just a really good 
match. So yeah, she was diagnosed shortly after that. We're quite lucky here that the process is very quick. She was diagnosed with autism and anxiety. And from then I just became, I guess, quite obsessed with researching it and really enjoying it and really passionate about finding out. And then that's when I thought, hang on a minute, this sounds like me. <laughs> This, this could be me um, and that's been another challenge really for both of us I don't have a diagnosis of autism but I have gone to a couple of professionals and they've just straight away I mean one just said I can tell when you walked in the room because you've got great eye contact I'm like so is my daughter and I did um, a course with the National Autistic Society which was for women and girls on the spectrum and it, you know I just felt that I really knew a lot about it and I wasn't being believed. I even rang one place for an appointment. And then she said, what's the appointment for? And I said, well, I'd like um, an assessment because I believe that I may be autistic. And she laughed at me on the phone. She just laughed and said, you can't be. She said, it's in children. You would have grown out of it by now. <laughs> or boys wow. or something. You know, so I've had all these comments. So I was like, right, okay. So I started to lose faith and even getting support for my daughter was really challenging because it's been a lot of... Um, things that we've not agreed with that haven't, you know, it's been a lot of behaviour modification. Um, ABA is really popular here. We've been told, again, just things that we need to be firmer. Oh, she's autistic. She definitely needs a good routine, uh, a real strict routine. I'm thinking, but I can't do routine. I really struggle. And if I can't do it, I can't help her. So I felt I was failing my daughter and didn't know who to sort of support first, myself or her, you know, I and can't. To some extent with the imposing routine and structure, I don't necessarily think that has to be the way to go because it's, if it's an, it, for many autistic people, not all autistic people, we obviously do have a need for structure and routine and sameness. And I'm one of those people. Mm -hmm. I do not need other people to impose it on me. It's yeah. an innate thing that I need and so almost I would expect, obviously you'd be able to support your child if they do have that need, but I would see some expectation from your own child if that's what she needed. Does that make sense? So there would be pushback against other people going against her needs for routine and structure, for instance. Yeah. Um, so that sounds yeah. like quite, yeah. And, yeah, and I don't disagree with the need for structure and routine, um, but obviously, yes, problematic for a number of reasons um, in terms of ABA. Um, mm. Were you seeing the, uh, the structure and the routine part that they were trying to instill? Was that part of the ABA? Is that where? We've never explored ABA and it wasn't really, um, that wasn't something that we were encouraged to do um we were encouraged to do cbt which she wouldn't cooperate with anyone anyway um she it was quite a difficult time and it's something again that you've spoken about that when we sought that diagnosis it was quite a negative thing because she knew that it was because we were having difficulties if i look at like the difference between her and my son I believe that he he's autistic, but we've never ever gone to get help because I think the environment meets his needs. Generally, he functions really well and we don't, he doesn't struggle, we don't struggle. Whereas with her, we were. So when she got this diagnosis, I think she, well, she did believe that it was something quite negative. Um, and that took a while to kind of undo and to make her realize that it wasn't all about the struggles we were having. Um, yeah, so we were told, um, CBT but she just didn't she doesn't want anything imposed on her and that's you know what you said is spot on anything that we impose she just she really pushes back and that's been what's really frustrating is to have people telling me what I need to feed her when I need her to go to bed what she needs to do and you know and I was told oh you're just not giving her a big enough reward when I said reward charts don't work, you need to go bigger, you need to go more. And I'm sitting there thinking, I know. I'm, and also I think coming from a teacher background was really frustrating. Speaking to a professional, whether it's you know a psychologist, psychiatrist or a teacher, and they're telling me about behavior. I'm like, I trained in behavior management. I worked in special needs schools and also schools and special measures with some really challenging kids. So I'm like, I know how to get kids to behave. I know all about, and I see it now as fear. And, you know, um, and, and that's the issue is that the problem with anything that starts and ends with behavior is always going to miss the mark. 
because you're missing well why that behavior and what is that behavior telling us what is that behavior um you know in indicating in terms of how that individual's feeling on the inside so it always is going to miss the mark um as opposed to just working with how the person's actually feeling and then that's going to be a difficulty for a number of reasons depending on age um elixithymia which i think might be one of your questions um should we jump into your actual questions questions here is what can we use instead when people ask the questions or people want to know more and you know is she high functioning okay so this is my notes that um to kind of help me get going on this issue because i've got lots um in relation to issues with functioning labels um for one thing it's actually being misused because a lot of people don't really in you know lay persons don't actually know what the di- diagnostic manuals say when it comes to functioning terminology and it's not used the way it's used in general pub- in the general public um, so this here is about the issues of functioning labels what we could talk about instead is support needs um, and I know I gave you an example because you asked, didn't you? You were kind of like, well, yeah, that's, it makes sense that we talk about support needs and how those can change. So if somebody at this point in time has high support needs, so they need a lot of support or they have low support needs, moderate, medium support needs. Um, and the reason the support needs is preferable is because it doesn't put the onus on the individual being faulty or broken or like we function like some robot, which is what I think functioning sounds like. Mm. Um, and because, and as I put here as a note, we all have support needs. And my issue when we talk about functioning labels, um, it just implies that all individuals are an island like nobody ever needs support from any other human being ever and that is not the case even if you're not autistic if you're considered to be neurotypical and don't have any form of neurodivergence all human beings need other human beings in some capacity and some will not need them as significantly if you like as somebody with higher support needs so i I think that's a preferable term because it allows for change as well and so I gave you an example um, when we were sort of chatting on Facebook, which was at present, my support needs are minimum. So, um, I, and as I've put here, nobody's support needs are ever non-existent. Even if you're not autistic, you have support needs from other people, whether those are social, emotional, they might be practical, like people helping you do the shopping. You know, we we have to rely on other human beings in some capacity. Um, Mm -hmm. And so my note is that I currently and for several years and for years to come, um, if not for perhaps the whole of my life, will need anxiety medication. The world for me as an autistic individual is sensorily emotionally and socially overwhelming and so i am anxious pretty much 24 7 even when people can't see it because my mask is quite good um i'm always anxious so i will always probably need an um, anxiety medication so i need mental well-being support that is currently basically at the moment i just kind of catch up with somebody who's technically my employer but also they support me in the work that I do supporting other students so I get to go to them and say how I'm doing that week that's a form of mental well-being support um when my support needs have been greater I have had CBT um grief counseling and a mentor when it comes to things like CBT which we can pick up on um because you said it didn't work for your daughter and I know why for a lot of reasons why it doesn't work for um, autistic people When I went to CBT, the first time I went, I didn't know I was autistic, but I was a psychology student. So I also knew the purpose of CBT. So I kind of could use the skills part as opposed to um, just kind of focusing on this abstract idea of reducing my anxiety or improving my well-being. I could focus on the skills bit. And then when I went back, when I knew I was autistic, I had CBT and grief counselling, and I knew then how to use the CBT in my favour. But not all autistic people will be able to do that. Mm. Um, 
My last point was um, other people and children may have higher or greater support needs, such as a speech therapist. They might have hospital stays or co-occurring conditions that need support like epilepsy and so on. And there's no reason not to use that to understand somebody. And I mm -hmm. guess my issue when it comes to functioning labels is say we said that your daughter was what, what uh, largely people saying high functioning, for instance. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Um, or we're talking about another autistic who's considered to be low functioning. Well, what mm. does that mean? Like mm. that really, that doesn't tell me anything. If you came to me and said, um, my autistic daughter currently has what I would consider moderate um, support needs. And this is why, um, mm. you know, another individual will come to me and say, okay, my autistic child or myself or, you know, an autistic adult has currently high support needs and that's because they have an intellectual disability and they also have epilepsy and they need this that and the other that tells me much more in actually a very few number of words mm. how to maybe approach that individual i think labeling everyone with really really simplistic terminology like high or low functioning how does that help anybody mm. kind of thing yeah, and I mean, who wants to be labelled as low functioning either? You know, that's, that's not very pleasant. But I, you know, if we were to go back to that language, I've got an example from a friend whose son would be classed as low functioning. You know, he's in a home, he has a lot of support. And my daughter would be classed as the high functioning because she was attending school. And as I say, nobody could tell. She appeared, she wore a mask, she, she could have a conversation, she can, you know, she's very independent. But... We have had this conversation with a friend where she said, actually, your daughter struggles with things that my son doesn't. And nobody would see it and nobody would notice. He can just do things. And, and perhaps I think anxiety is a big part of that, you know, and, and that's why the needs can change. She may be able to go to school for a period of time and be absolutely fine. But then there comes a time where she can't even put the uniform on and she can't get out of the house and she's not sleeping and nobody sees that. And that for me is quite frustrating. And I think that's where the labels overlook that. And again, then it looks at me, people look at me, why is she not coming to school? That, that's a parenting thing, not, you know, looking underneath that, well, there's anxiety and, and why is that? So. And mm. she's safer at home. So she gets to do all the, you know, the meltdowns and the extreme need to stim and things like that in a place where she's safe. Mm. And I think the issue when people use and, use very simplistic functioning labels is they also equate it very incorrectly to the idea of maybe happiness or content or um just how the individual actually experiences life so you could for instance have uh, an autistic individual with high support needs like you say who perhaps needs to um stay in a residential um home or something along those lines that doesn't mean that they're necessarily unhappy or that their well-being is poor or something along those lines so i think a lot of the time people also when they consider low versus high they also it's not just about whether that person's mental well-being is better or not it's is their life a good life that kind mm. of thing i think that's what also gets tied into it a very negative idea that if you're low functioning it can't be a good life mm. Dependent on the individual what if they're really really happy they've got the support they need they're yeah. still considered low functioning but but they have high support needs they're getting those support needs and actually their well-being is quite good and yeah. then you might have somebody who's high functioning what we would class as at that point in time maybe less support need but they're actually miserable because they're nobody's actually seeing the support that they yeah the person needs <laughs> And that's what I see as well. Like my friend's son and children that I've worked with often, they've seemed to be really happy, you know, and yeah, I've seen my daughter really struggle and be really, really unhappy. Um, and I think that, yeah, it, it's, it's interesting really. Um, my final point, I guess, when it comes to the functioning labels <clears throat> is this, is that people misuse and misunderstand the diagnostic manuals. And so mm -hmm. Harry and I actually, at one point, we're going to do a video where we pull apart the okay. whole of the DSM's diagnostic um, mm -hmm. uh, criteria and what they actually say in the manual, for instance. But this is important here 
because people always go well you know well they're severely autistic and they're low functioning and and, and this kind of language that's problematic but it's also being used incorrectly as much as i have a problem with that language when you actually look at the diagnostic manuals it doesn't even say what people are the way that people are using it if that makes sense mm -hmm. so when you see here the severity specifiers they may be used to describe so that's the levels one two and three they may be used to describe succinctly the current symptomatology obviously i have lots of issues with words like symptoms and things like that but we're just going with what it actually says mm -hmm. so to describe current symptomatology so at that point in time which might fall below level one with the recognition that severity may vary by context and fluctuate over time people miss that that is key because i have had parents say to me i don't understand functioning labels or severity because my child was classed as severely or low functioning etc etc when they were seven and now that they're 11 they're not that way anymore Mm. of course because we're human beings and we adapt and we change and the mm. issue with functioning language and severity and things like that is it doesn't allow for change and then people are confused when autistic people change um and i always give the example of you know if you have a non-autistic so a neurotypical child um who has no other neurodivergences um and they're sitting there picking their nose and doing silly child things that ch children do at like three, you can tell I don't have children, um, at, you know, sort of three years old. Nobody looks at them and goes, oh, they're going to be like that when they're 30. You know, they're not frozen in time. But for some reason we do that, well, not us personally, but people do that to autistic people. They imagine that at that point in time, when they get that diagnosis, that they're frozen that way. And that's not the case. We develop in different ways. My sister was... Um, pretty much mute until she was three and now you can't stop her talking you know <laughs> so it doesn't allow for that change whereas in the manual it allows for that change were you aware of that were you aware that actually it does state in here that it's based on current no no um and i could just think of an example with my son um because as i say he doesn't have a diagnosis and we've not had an assessment and generally he you know I, i've always wondered i remember when he was younger using the word and um, oh that's quite aughty because he would he would just he was only interested in one thing and he would line his toys up and i just you know i thought i knew a bit about autism so that's quite aughty but we've not had meltdowns or any behavior things and, and but then at the beginning of lockdown we did his behavior changed dramatically and he was struggling and i went back to be marshall and i said I, I kind of didn't know if it's the right words to use. I said, is it possible that someone can become more autistic? <laughs> and it's even something I think about myself sometimes. The more I look into autism and recognize it, it's like I recognize it and it almost makes it stronger. And I think, oh, can you become more autistic? But her response anyway was really useful. She said to me, absolutely. She said, if the environment isn't meeting his needs. And I thought, yeah, you know, that... He, he wasn't really expressing what we didn't know why he was struggling but at the beginning of lockdown you know that was quite a tough time and the environment wasn't meeting his needs and therefore you know we had we were seeing meltdowns and we were seeing like he would uh, he become selective mute is that the right way to say it yeah, yeah. i say selective mutism <laughs> mutism yeah yeah that's fine <laughs> and, the, and then now that's the interesting thing isn't it is that so obviously i understand appearing more autistic in a sort of autistic friendly way but i can imagine that non-autistic people will see that as there's a worsening of symptoms mm. and so annette and i have spoken to so annette foster who i do the so your autistic program with and, and lots of other things we have spoken about how sometimes actually appearing more autistic can be the best thing for you as well because it means you're not hiding how you're feeling on the inside you're not masking for instance um, and so definitely there are going to be times where you appear 
more autistic basically all that means is that your autistic expression is just more apparent than mm -hmm. than usual for instance um, and usually that also happens for adults when we get diagnosed because you kind of drop the mask and then people say oh well you never used to do that thing it's like yeah because I was hiding that thing you know that and then you oh you're appearing more autistic now yeah. the thing is you're always autistic you know, it's mm -hmm. a neurodevelopmental condition. We are born with a different neurology. We will die with this different neurology. And then it depends on so many different factors throughout your life about how you then interact with the world, whether that's a very apparently to other people autistic way or not. But on mm -hmm. the inside, you're just as autistic at every stage, if that yeah. makes sense. Yeah, um, that's how, definitely how I feel myself you know, like just, just recognizing it and being within my close family where I've been talking about it. I do feel like that mask is dropping. So the, the behaviors are coming out more and, and it is more natural. Yeah. And it's, and it can be healthier. So like yeah. I say, when Annette and I talk about this, we talk about the difference between internal type autistic, which is when we come onto the degendering part of autism, mm -hmm. Um, in a minute then that will come up there but the internal type autistic which at the moment is predominantly seen as a female thing um, but it's not and then the more external type autistic now all individuals who are autistic can literally be a combination of both obviously where they experience internal um, or very masked experience of being autistic and then the opposite where you're just your autistic experience is just much more observable to other human beings mm. um, and and as you said, because your son has displayed quite clear um, expressions of being autistic, the reason perhaps that he's not been he's been picked up maybe by you, but not necessarily that um, a, a diagnostician or somebody would want to diagnose them is because they don't see him as suffering. Mm. And this is really interesting because I'm actually writing a chapter for an edited book. Um, it's a critical autism uh, reader and I'm writing about uh, the need for autistic identity community culture and space but within that I'm talking about the criticism of the diagnostic manuals because when we had the update where Asperger's was removed there was a discussion about the DSM and what it's based on so the diagnostic manual and why a disorder is classed as disorder when mm. there's no biological markers for disorder pathology and there's been differences across the different manuals about what they, how they would classify something as a disorder. And at one point it was about suffering. It was about whether you were suffering. So you can have, for instance, people who hear voices who aren't suffering. Yeah. So should they get a diagnosis, this kind of thing. Um, this is a whole other conversation about whether we should even be seeing autistic experience in um, pathology you know, in a diagnostic manual in the first place. My argument is we shouldn't. But mm. the reason that your son wouldn't get picked up is because he's not seen as suffering. Yeah. And that makes no sense because he's still autistic, right? So, yeah, I might yeah, cut some of that out. It was a bit waffly. <laughs> but I'm glad you've touched on that because that is a question I've had. There's been many times where I've thought, should we go and have an assessment anyway? And, and that's a conversation I've had with lots of friends as well. Like often parents wonder, like, what can we gain from whether either parents or an individual, what's to gain from a diagnosis? And there's times where I feel guilty for not having them assessed. And then there's other times where I don't even really think about it. Um, but it is, it's all, it, it feels like the, the main reason for going and seeking that piece of that document would be because there was some suffering or some need that you know needs to be met but at um, some point it needs to, I and I've said this before that we you know I don't know if this will ever happen in my lifetime but most things that are in those diagnostic manuals not just autism need to be removed people identify realize that they are e.g autistic mm. connect with the community to understand mm. themselves and then still be able to seek support because it shouldn't be your support should not be predicated on whether you have this idea of a pathology yeah. um and dependent on where you are in the world and dependent where you are in the uk um for instance local councils um and education um you don't actually need to have a diagnosis to get the support and a lot of people don't know that because schools don't make it 
that clear for obvious reasons. They don't want all and sundry to need support that they have, which is a minimal resource for them, which is a problematic um, thing in and of itself. Did you know that? Like, I know you're not in the UK now, but for lots of schools, you actually don't need a diagnosis to seek the support that you would get. No, and I think also being like me and my husband are teachers, we should know that. And I th it, it does kind of ring a bell, but maybe we've been out of the UK for too long. My husband would know more than me. Um, but no, but I feel like a lot of parents seek the diagnosis to get the support yeah. in, a, in a battle, you know, and, yeah. and maybe because there is scarcity around that. And it is different in this country. But for me, the diagnosis with my daughter got me more than support. It was like acknowledgement and acceptance. It was acceptance for me and it was reassuring for me but I think it was almost like a shield like it was it was a lot about me at the time as well that I could go and tell people that it wasn't me it wasn't my parents it wasn't the parenting yeah yeah and, and it, yeah so. there's so much caught up with the idea of diagnosis it's a very interesting thing because for me I knew I was autistic but I still needed that piece of paper and once I actually got the diagnosis from a professional, you know, clinician or diagnostician, it was really anticlimactic because I already knew, <laughs> you know, I built it up. And then when I got it, it was like, yeah, I know. Like yeah. that was really anti, anticlimactic for me. Um, but that's about a need to completely reform education, how we look at diagnoses, like why are those important when somebody's clearly struggling you you should be supporting them regardless of whether they got a diagnosis why would anybody need less support when you can see that they're struggling for instance mm. that's about reform of a whole system yeah. um which we'll we'll keep fighting for um so back <laughs> to the specifiers so anyway um so severity of social communication difficulties and restrictive repetitive behaviours should be separately rated. The descriptive severity category should not be used to determine eligibility for provision or services. Interesting. Um, these can only be developed at an individual level and through discussion of personal priorities and targets. So again, that's kind of people shouldn't really be using the diagnosis to seek support anyway. Should be getting support because your support needs kind of yeah. thing. So that's quite an interesting point that they've got in the DSM. So it's there's in that very short paragraph, there's a lot there that's kind of very much not understood in lay the lay public's understanding of what autism is and what it isn't. I'm a big believer in this support needs. I think I don't know whether that was my language for it before I asked you the question, but since I mean I, I guess my perspective being a teacher and then having a daughter, even before we knew the diagnosis maybe I knew that I needed to treat her differently yeah I think long before the diagnosis and maybe and probably even before I, I knew it was a very short window of time long before autism was even mentioned to me I knew that she didn't respond to rewards and punishment and I that opened up a whole new world for me and how to treat children with respect and as you said looking at the root cause of a behavior um, <clears throat> and it made me think about my teaching practice and just everything that I'd learned before in, <clears throat> in that if we look at an individual and what their needs are, you know, we kind of remove the behaviours. Um, and it, it just made me want to change so much in education. And I felt like I was going against the majority of people trying to say that actually, you know, we don't need to control other people or punish or... or or kind of yeah use any fear based particularly perhaps with autistic children is it has to be intrinsic motivation and value of something and just mm -hmm. holding up a toy of some description or removing that toy of some description yeah nothing like that bothered her and that's what opened me up way before that to the, to the benefit of you know intrinsic motivation and autonomy and I think, you know, these are skills that we really need and want. So for me, like, whether you're autistic or anything else, it doesn't really matter. And I think, you know, working with individuals, looking at their needs is far more important. Um, yeah, and kind of links in with trying to change behaviour. Like, it just doesn't sit with me at all. 
and it, yeah. yeah and that's the issue it's trying to change behavior like you say without even understanding why and the wherefores of the behavior and sometimes it can be the simplest thing to support that individual but the policies of say a school won't allow it because mm -hmm. i remember being asked by a ta um some advice they had a um two autistic children actually um who they wanted me to try and understand a behavior that they had one of them um so trigger warning we're talking a little bit about um skin picking was skin picking their hand mm -hmm. and scarring it and the other was because they weren't allowed to stim with any objects any toys or anything because you're in class and you're not allowed to play with objects all my students in undergrad regardless of whether they're autistic or not adhd or not are allowed to play with objects that i bring into the seminar rooms and i'm talking about adults here what yeah. children play right um was was um getting calluses on their on their palms their hands because they were stimming in a way that they could do while other people couldn't see it and they were um like say scarring their their hands and this other child was picking i said well the child that's picking can you not replace that with like let them have play-doh to do the same action oh no that'll get in the carpet yeah okay. carpet also <laughs> versus a child and that wasn't the ta saying that they were worried about the carpet it would be that the school would be worried about the carpet that kind of thing remove the carpet for heaven's sake yeah. you know we're talking about a carpet versus a child scarring their body so yeah. it is and and trying to understand well why are they even doing that in the first place can we remove that harmful stim with a, a, a safe stim and also identify why they're doing it in the first place what's causing them that distress mm -hmm. um yeah okay. loads of examples there yeah where school just hasn't been able to meet her needs where it could be really really simple yeah and sometimes it is really simple like so i, I mean i'm talking about undergraduates uh, at, you know at university um but in my seminars i use participation cards because regardless of whether they have a mental health issue that's diagnosed or disclosed or a neurodevelopmental difference lots of students get anxiety about being asked questions for instance or having to be called on in class come in the room they all have to pick a participation card that says how they're willing to participate in that session mm. um, and that can change every week or it can be the same every week and then they have them sitting in front of them so when i'm doing the se session i can tell who not to ask a question uh, okay you know and it gives them that little bit of breathing space to know and feel safe that okay i won't be asked now and yeah. sometimes the ones that have a card that says that they don't want to answer anything that day they do but yeah. that's given them that sort of little safety of but that's my decision it's down to me whether i participate today i won't be called on and made to feel yeah. uncomfortable or embarrassed and everybody like i say i bring a, a, my stim suitcase in which has got toys and objects because <laughs> i'm stimming because i'm teaching yeah. and they all know yeah. i'm autistic i have right. to have my object <laughs> i love that you've just said that even though it, it was quite uncomfortable for me to hear it because I am that person who I'm, I'm really uncomfortable if I'm going to be called upon. Um, you know, any events where you think you may be pulled out of the audience is just, yeah, even if there's a raffle for a prize or bingo, I'm like, no, 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 I, I don't want to be involved. And yet sometimes I can't help but be involved. And I guess that is if your anxiety is low enough or you just feel comfortable. But yeah, even though I've experienced that, I have been trained to go into the classroom and pick on those kids who are not getting involved and I have I've said if your hand's not up I will ask you the question and I will and I'm feeling uncomfortable thinking oh wow you know I, I did that so your question was um why is it not appropriate to stereotype autism by gender or I mean how did you phrase it was that how you phrased it um probably I think if I just I think I touched on it earlier that I found out or I realized that my daughter was autistic because I was pointed in the direction of the female presentation of autism and that made sense to me and then when I thought about it I was like wow my classroom was boys or, or everyone for one there was one girl who I used to do some respite work with um but yeah I thought, oh yeah and I'm, I'm my training I learned was it four to one with boys so that made sense to me and then I did the course with the National Autistic Society so I've now been trying to share this information with other people and recognizing 
um, a lot of, of young girls, or actually adults as well, I've, I've recognised a lot of females, oh, I think you're probably autistic. So it surprised me when you mentioned that it's not helpful to, to stereotype by gender. And again, how you explained it made sense, but it's still, I guess, a little bit of a sticking point for me. <laughs> and I think, so basically, the way I kind of consider it now is that everybody and and the public's always the last is really behind already so it's been you know the research and the idea of what autism is has been based on a male sort of stereotype and a male bias for absolutely years you were talking like you know 70 70 years um mm. or around around that and now it's moved on to recognizing that actually girls can be autistic too Mm. And that's already out of date as well, that idea, because you will see, you know, straight men and boys who present in a, in quotation marks, female presentation, but they're not female. They don't have female autism mm. and you, and vice versa. You will also, so I'm wondering, obviously without not too much detail, but you said you only had maybe one girl in a class oh, yeah. full of boys. Would you say that she was quite similar to the boys? Yes. She, exactly. She was, but she wasn't, yeah. she didn't have male autism. She wasn't male in any way, but her presentation yes. on the spectrum was, was again, how I would recognise Exactly. at the time. So yeah. the way I kind of would explain it then, I guess, is that, yes, we're seeing a lot more women um, and girls who present in a particular way, which, which we would consider quite a masked autistic way. So what I would class as quite an internal autistic presentation where it's quite small, the, the behaviors are not as observable to outsiders and it's all kind of internalized and on the inside. And so, yes, predominantly we are seeing that that's a, a female or a girl thing. Um, but like I say, you also do see boys, men, non-binary and trans people with that presentation and vice versa. So it's not necessarily, there are, there's no female or male autism, but mm. there are definitely autistic males, women, non-binary and trans people. <clears throat> and then within that, they will have different presentations just based on potluck, I guess, how, yeah. how we you know, are born. So I am an autistic woman and I identify as woman. Um, so I'm an autistic woman and I would have what's classed or what I class as an internal presentation or, or it used to be much more internal. It's a little bit more obvious now, I think, to, to people who spend time with me. Um, does that make sense? So then you'll have, like, yeah. so typically when, when I see different autistic people and the difference that I see in terms of those who were diagnosed early in childhood and those in um, later life, like adolescence or adulthood, is the difference between whether they were very observably autistic to other people, mm. so what I was classed as external type autistic, or yeah. much more internal style. And it's regardless of gender. So yes, I probably would say I see more males and cis or straight males um, who present with that more external type where they got diagnosed younger mm. than I do girls and women who, um, who are cis as well. Um, but yeah, you see, and then you see the reverse as well. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think so. So, so do you think that's a better way of describing it, by whether it's internal or external? Yeah, and talking about masking. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, Annette and I need to publish a paper on it because we have a whole three-dimensional space that we talk about this where yeah. you can understand removing, um, sort of moving away from the idea of the spectrum because I don't think the spectrum is very helpful anymore um but yes talking about it in terms of and again all autistic individuals have elements of both external and internal it yeah. just depends to what degree at different times in your life so and to who as well yep you're comfortable with so schools will miss masked autistics so boys and girls and non-binary and trans people because they have that masked internal yeah. style autistic experience at school because they're anxious they're hiding they're you know they're different 
And then when they get home, you guys will see it because yeah. they'll be much more external. There'll be meltdowns. There'll be this, there'll be that. Well, it must be the parents then. Well, actually, no, <laughs> it's showing that you are that safe space for them to literally, you, you can only hold in your sensory differences and needs, overwhelm, burnout for a period, a short period of time, really, um, mm. depending on who you are. Um, and it's got to come out somewhere. So when they, when that happens at home, you are that safe space. Yeah. That's not necessarily a good thing for you or the child, but at least take some, what's, what word do I want? Satis not satisfaction. Reassurance. Yes. Thank you. Some reassurance that yes, it's a struggle for everybody involved at the home, mm. but it also represents safety and love because yeah. they can do that there yeah yeah and thinking about it I mean I, I, a lot of people are coming to me at the moment talking to me and a friend recently messaged me and, and she's telling me that her, how her daughter is in school and that's not the case with my daughter like she her mask is just flawless I guess like to the outside world there are no sensory issues there are no like it's actually quite it's quite frightening for me actually she will come by with the outside world what, what she's told to do and yet that's the opposite of of, how, of her comfort level like she really doesn't want to be told what to do she needs autonomy and control absolutely so that that's quite a concern for me but yeah there there are other females that people tell me about my friends talk to me about their daughters and how they are socially and i think oh they're they're not quite ticking those boxes of the female who masks, for example. So, yeah. So do you think it's a good idea to, to completely drop that? Like I have been advocating for this female presentation and therefore I feel like lots of people are coming to me and noticing what they hadn't noticed before, but perhaps I could talk about it in, in a different way. Yeah, in, and, in, and in, I'm in happy for internal way. and external to be picked up. Mm. And to understand, like I say, that all autistic people have both, and yeah. it just depends on lots of factors, like age, um, support needs at that time, whether they're actually getting that support. Um, what we tend to see is we become much more external in our presentation once we're diagnosed as an adult, because like I said, then you appear more autistic. It's not that, it's just you're more comfortable, perhaps, mm. you know, there's so many factors that go into it. And definitely talking about masking. Because yeah. like I say, regardless of gender, you know, autistic people can mask. Yeah. Some not so much so than others. And that's, again, not a necessarily a gendered thing. Um, yeah. And what I would probably say is, the, yeah, the difference that you will see in between those that get diagnosed young and those that get diagnosed um, later in life is, regardless of gender, about the masking and whether people actually notice that they're autistic. Yeah. Um, and what you said about your daughter, like say concern because you can't see what's going on. My concern with her, and this is something that I've wanted help with and I've never been able to find the help, is that I don't want her to do as she's told. And that sounds crazy coming from a parent. I don't, you know? Yeah, and yeah compliance is, me, is well, tell scary. Me, no, I can't, I can't tell her to put her shoes on, but yet if you told her to put her shoes on she would put her shoes on you know even if they didn't fit her or there was nails in them i think and i sound dramatic when i say it to people i gave an example to the teacher when she was going into year four and it was a meeting with the teacher and the head of year and i gave a really dramatic example and it ended up just having the opposite effect and what has happened is she she since as long as i can remember has been able to dress herself and has been very particular on what she wore and how and very private as well but she almost freezes around other people and we're in a, a culture here where there's a lot of help a lot of families have nannies and even when you're out and about like we could go into a shopping mall and she might want to try on a pair of shoes but the assistant will come and try and do it for her and she does she goes mute she appears shy quiet and often if i'm there she'll look at me with desperation to help her and I will have to step in. But there's times when I'm not there. And before she was diagnosed, you know, we, I didn't really realize this was an issue. She was at a friend's house and she'd been swimming in the swimming pool and she got out of the pool and the nanny went straight over to her, put a towel around her, started to undress her. 
Now she was way too old for that, way too old. Well, it's a, it's, it's a mentality thing. My son, she was probably the same age as my son now, he would need me to dress him, but he would tell me or he would yeah. tell the person. But this lady, meaning well, it's not well-meaning people, just started to dress her. Now I didn't know about this and she never really would come and tell me anything either. But it was only the next time she was going to that house, she said, I don't want to go. Why? Um, because the nanny dressed me. And I was like, really shocked. And so I didn't I think, realize yeah. how difficult, when I give that example to a teacher and said, she will comply. And I know it sounds strange to say to a teacher, I don't want her to comply. Because no, you, and, and I know. She's a good girl she is. She's such a good no. girl. I'm like, I don't want her to be a good girl. No, you want her to be an autonomous, <laughs> safe, safe person. Mm -hmm. um i think that sounds like a quite an important thing that a lot of autistic people struggle with again regardless of gender which is boundaries and mm. and that is about learning when you're uncomfortable what that means because some of us we just don't know like your daughter might not really understand when she's that uncomfortable what that means and that actually she has the right to say no and she that's told me, sorry to interrupt, but she told me she doesn't want to offend anyone. Yeah. And, and that's, that's about, again, learning about how boundaries are actually, res they respect everybody. Mm. So boundaries help with respect without offending in the sense of learning how to put boundaries in place in a way that's assertive, but not you know, you're not trying to confront other people or anything like that. And this is such a big thing for the autistic. And I find that quite tricky as well. Mm. I think, yeah, I think look into finding um, a professional of some description that can help, I guess, with a sort of like teaching about boundaries to some said to some extent, assertiveness maybe for your mm -hmm. daughter. Yeah. Um, and just being, again, being honest with her and saying, I wouldn't have felt comfortable with that mm. either at your age. And do you know what? I don't have to do that thing if it mm. makes me uncomfortable. I think a lot of the time it is about um, role modelling the things that we want our children yeah. to understand, perhaps. I say our children when I don't have any. Yeah. Um, I have snails. That doesn't count. Um, <laughs> a giant African land snail. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so I think, yeah, I, I mean, it's good that you've picked up on it and that it's something that you're trying to advocate for her. So mm. I think, yeah, getting somebody professional perhaps to actually try yeah. and instill those things. Um, I just don't know how or where, and I almost feel like we need to do it together. <laughs> you know, it's something I could do. And why do. not? Why not do, yeah, why not do those things together? Because again, you know, if you're doing it, then it's okay. Yeah. You know? It's all right to say, no, I don't want to do X, Y, Z or put those things in. But it is difficult. It is something we have to learn. I don't think we're intuitive when it comes to. No, and something I hear a lot with children as well is well, there's a whole big can of worms, I guess. But I hear a lot about teachers. I don't really want to generalize with teachers. It's not all teachers, it's adults, any adults with children will often say things like, Oh, go on, it will make me happy. And it goes back to that intrinsic motivation. But you know, I don't want them to do things to make you happy. And I hear it all the time. Or other things, you know, children's um, feelings um, disregarded, you know, oh, it hurts. No, it doesn't. You're okay. Don't cry. Or it's heavy. No, it's not. You can do it. And, and kind of that, just not listening to what they're saying. And I think they're not going to keep saying it if you're not listening and you don't believe them. And that is invalidation and it mm. can become invalidation trauma when that happens throughout mm. your whole life. So, um, so we did have a discussion on invalidation trauma with Kim Rhodes a few weeks back. So there's, there's a live on that, um, mm. which is exactly as you say, you then do not trust your own feelings or your own body. If everybody's telling you, no, 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 it doesn't hurt. Or yeah. no, you're not hungry. You know, we've got dinner in, in 15 minutes, that kind of thing. And then if that happens enough, you never trust your own mm. feelings or perspective. The label that I have from childhood is drama queen. 
and it's only now and and it's again I see it in my daughter I could label her with it sometimes I think God, you're overreacting and I have to have a little word with myself no she's not and I know she's not because I feel it you know hypersensitive hypervigilance all those things like I feel everything and it's really hard to be branded as someone who overreacts all the time because it's I, I just think that your reaction is is your reaction you know that it, it's valid finding way to talk about um why it's not appropriate to stereotype autism by gender so yes talking mm -hmm. about masking and internalized type autistic um as opposed to female autism uh oh this was one of your questions mm -hmm. so yeah. what can i say to a medical professional who dismissed my autistic identity due to my eye contact i would show them page 54 in the diagnostic manual <laughs> that is literally what i probably would do <laughs> um so i mean again i have issues with the language in here so i'm just reading it verbatim yeah. so deficits in nonverbal communicative behaviors used for social interaction are manifested by absent reduced or atypical use of eye contact relative to cultural norms which makes it even more bizarre because are you as autistic in another culture if their cultural norms is not to look at people in the eyes um just as facial expressions, body orientation, or speech intonation. An early feature of autism spectrum disorder is impaired joint attention as manifested by a lack of pointing, showing, or bringing objects to share interests with others, or failure to follow someone's pointing or eye gaze. Individuals may learn a few functional gestures, but their repertoire is smaller than that of others, and they often fail to use expressive gestures spontane spontaneous spontaneously, no, spontaneously thank you um in communication among adults with fluent language so this is still autistics with fluent language the difficulty in coordinating nonverbal communication with speech may give the impression of odd wooden or exaggerated body language during interactions impairment may be relatively subtle within individual modes e.g someone may have relatively good eye contact when speaking but noticeable in poor integration of eye contact gesture body posture pros prosody 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 and facial expression for social communication. So yeah, I would just show them page 54 of the DSM. I'm gonna write it down, 54, okay, yeah. Because it doesn't state that to be autistic and diagnosed as autistic, you should not be making eye contact. Mm. And particularly if we're late to diagnosed and masked autistics, um, our eye contact is um kind of like a learnt like i never actually look at anybody in the eye um the only person whose eye color i actually know is my partners and my sisters i think i don't know anybody else's eye color um doesn't matter how long i've known them because i don't look people in the eye it just mm. feels like i do and i've learnt over the years i don't know why but obviously because of social norms perhaps dictating it to look at people's mouths or look at the nose where it looks like you're looking at the person mm. um so even then i would not necessarily get picked up considering i'm yeah. still not actually making eye contact yeah i've been told i've got fleeting eye contact and it is that kind of i'm no i notice everything going on but yeah. i have i'm aware that i should be looking at someone so i try yeah. Look back and then sometimes i'm really conscious and I, yeah but then you would meet that top part which is absent mm. reduced or atypical use mm. right yeah. and because that's vague in and of itself atypical use is vague yeah right so yes gps or whoever it is that you're um who've said well no you've got fleeting eye contact then they haven't looked at the diagnostic manuals mm. any other thoughts on eye contact not really. I think that covers it, doesn't it? If they don't know, I think when it was said to me, it was by a psychiatrist. And I always find that these professionals get very defensive. And, you know, I told him, like, I'd literally just done this training about girls and women and my daughter had been diagnosed. So I got defensive as well. So I was, you know, I said, well, that's not true for my daughter and that's not true for my learning. And, and for me, whether it's this or other things, unfortunately, I've gone to so many different professionals now that I just have to like cross them off my list when I feel like I know more. That sounds awful, doesn't it? I no, but the thing is, I know more, or I know, I know more about myself or my child, and and you're not listening, you're not hearing me, and you're not. Mm. And it really just depends on who you're seeing. Um, so, for instance, I do not know if I would have got diagnosed 
if I hadn't gone to a center where they're used to seeing presentations like mine, mm. do you see what I mean? So if they weren't used to seeing um, masked yeah. women autistics, for instance, um, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. So um, I would say, you know, look for people who can, who know what they're doing, know what they're talking about, know what they're looking for. Mm. Um, and because sometimes when people say to me, oh, they've gone to their GP and I'm like, yeah, but, and their GP said, well, no, we're not going to put you through because you can't be autistic because you make eye contact, for instance, and so on mm -hmm. and so forth. But they're nothing to do. They're a GP. They're a general practitioner. They yeah. don't understand the intricacies and the nuances of being autistic. They're mm -hmm. not the best place individual. No, that's, I guess it's, I was thinking that in the UK you're better off because I hear people in the UK who say they can find, they can <clears throat> find someone who is experienced, you know, for the diagnosis. Whereas I feel a bit more limited here, but I also don't have to go through a GP. Everything is word of mouth here. So I just, you know, I just, if I met you in Abu Dhabi and you told me who diagnosed you, then I would call them and I would go to them. And in that way, it's easier, but it is word of mouth and it is just finding. Where are they kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. Um, and only yesterday, somebody called me to say the same, you know, asked me advice about what the psychiatrist had told her about her daughter. And it, I just wanted to scream. I'm like, no, no, I don't agree with, with what they said. You know, that she went and said that, why, you know, she thinks that she may be on the spectrum and was talking about anxiety. And all we said is you need to do more timeouts more um boundaries more ignoring behavior <laughs> no, no that's a very outdated mode of parenting in general surely yeah, yeah absolutely but I could, I could just sense that she was doubting herself then because it's the professional and now you know i didn't feel comfortable then saying i know more because you don't they are you know that is their job but i think maybe they are outdated when i when you're when you're talking about yourself or your child and, and you are researching heavily then do you feel like you know more if if i mean if i were to so so in terms of me realizing i was autistic i'd always know the typical thing that you hear about adults getting diagnosed always know that was different i would felt always an outsider alienated i had all these odd behaviors etc etc um never considered to be autistic never even crossed my mind that I could possibly be autistic started dating my partner about five or so years ago um knowing he was autistic and ADHD still didn't think that I could possibly be autistic because he's nothing like me I mean mm. he wouldn't be he's his own individual and he's six foot three with a beard he's nothing like me um and he's also got the attention differences which I don't have mm -hmm. so I still didn't consider it it's only because I happened to start seeing female autistics on ted talks yeah. and things like that and i was like light bulb i'd mm -hmm. done three years as an undergraduate thought it was a male thing and only boys were autistic do you mm -hmm. see you know and yeah. that was so my undergraduate degree was already dated um mm -hmm. and then i started looking into it doing my own like say research um and then you get absorbed into the autistic community and that's where you really, because we've got some amazing researchers in the autistic community because of our specializations, even if you're not um, a so-called professional academic or researcher. Um, and you will find the most useful information from the actual community itself than professionals, because professionals, you might be lucky and find an autistic autism professional, mm. which would be like a unicorn, um or gold dust um but professionals you know largely speaking how, how much time do they actually spend with numerous autistic people yeah to actually be able to know the nuances of our behaviors and our thoughts and hopes and our anxiety yeah. and all this kind of thing it's always going to be missing the mark i feel like everything that they say to me is from some textbook whether it's, you know, telling me about this routine that I need to put in place or eye contact. And it's just all feels like it's come from a book. And the best thing that's happened to me is finding the autistic community, you know, and 
whenever some I've got friends who say oh, I don't like Facebook I think well I get that I don't like a lot of things about Facebook there's a lot of amazing communities out there that have been life-saving for me um, and I know how difficult it is as a newly discovered autistic and how it, difficult it must be as a parent um, to find the decent communities online because there is a lot of the negative pathology um, which is why I've got that really brief document that's just called a brief guide starting guide to the autistic resources or something like that so you can find follow the breadcrumbs they're, the, they're kind of like the key advocates that are really good in the community like Kieran Rose the autistic advocate um, neurodivergent rebel in the states um, mm. Emma Dalmain's um, autism inclusivity groups all these kinds of things so as soon as you find those you can then follow the breadcrumbs of what they suggest yeah. as well and then you don't necessarily have to get sucked into the negative narrative yes okay so during my teaching practice very early on when I, I trained to be a special needs teacher I had training in autism but I was told that I always use the language whether it's autism or a physical disability but it's a child with a physical disability it's not a disabled child and um, so it's a child with autism not an autistic child and again I, I thought that was the way to do it and I knew that was correct and then over the last few years I've had to unlearn that and understand and it, it does it does make sense. I thought that was something we could explain here. Definitely. And and this is the thing is that we learn things and we don't really understand sort of the nuances of where that language comes from. So I went to secondary school in the late nineties and we were taught, we understood that to be polite and correct, we were to call mixed race people or mixed ethnicity. Um, half cast yes. and now I understand how derogatory that is but at the time we didn't know that we weren't educated about the origins of that language and I feel to some extent that's the same with things like person first language is that it's just instilled in people and they're not really understanding the nuances of what it means mm. um, this is um, a little short paragraph from um, a, a blog that I have called the importance of language what's in a name um, and so I'll just read my little quote which is many will lament that I must be called a person with or living with autism because I am a person first because I'm more than a label I agree I am more than a label and being autistic is more than a label more than a diagnosis and more than a misunderstanding that I am disordered it's a community a social identity a life my life I am autistic it colours every aspect of my interaction with and experience of the world. I am autistic because I know that I'm not disordered, that I have a neurodivergent, neurodevelopmental difference. And what I, I understand why people think that person first language is preferable. Mm. Um, but what it indicates, I guess, to autistic people is that people do see autism as this separate potentially curable potentially set separable something you could remove yeah. from a normal individual underneath mm. and if you take if, if they could find autism which at this point in time there's no biological markers we don't know what makes an autistic individual autistic um you know if you could remove that I would be a completely different person. There wouldn't, there's, there's not this normal underneath. It's, it literally colors everything about me. And mm -hmm. I remember, so when we have some students who come to us who are just sort of starting their journey of understanding they're autistic, they'll ask, which bit, what about me is autistic? And it doesn't work that way, but that's how this language and the pathologization of being autistic, that's what it does. It makes yeah. us think that there's, something separate and and if only you could remove that pesky thing yeah um, and i found today which is lovely this is called um it's by the able fables okay. um, which i really liked on facebook mm. and they've got a number of lovely infographics so they're just showing you the differences so i am autistic which is identity first um and then people are argue about is it should it be an identity and all this kind of thing well 
it really depends on if you're like me and don't consider it a, patholo a pathology mm. or are you a person with autism so a person who has a pathology that could potentially be removed for them mm. so what is identity first language understands and values that a diagnosis trait or difference is an inherent or essential essential part of an individual's identity so you can't carry it separate like they've got in this little drawing which is by mm -hmm. um, identityfirstautistic.org it's literally the whole who i am like i say i i was born will live and will die as an autistic person and you won't be able to remove it from me First and first language understands and values that a diagnosis is separate from the individual's identity. So this is where you would see the differences. Yeah. I am a person with a disability. I am disabled. Now, this is interesting because I tend to meet what I would, not all, because I don't want to completely generalise, but mm. typically older disabled people prefer to consider themselves a person with a disability. Mm. younger people consider themselves disabled because dis to be disabled is not this negative dirty word there's nothing inherently wrong with being disabled mm. um, and it will mean that their life and their experiences of the world are different to somebody who's not disabled so it's quite important to respect that part of who they are and that identity mm. um, you know it's like the deaf community reclaimed they you know they aren't people with a hearing impairment or with deafness they are deaf with a capital d and they have a whole community and language and culture um which is amazing and then obviously the same with um i am autistic versus i am a person with autism yeah and where you say you would die with it you, you wouldn't want it removed would you no if not and I've you thought know. about that mm. um, with, without going into detail because there's no need. I have been suicidal in my mm. early uh, 20s, late, well, my late teens and my early 20s. Um, deeply, deeply miserable at points in my life. And because I have that ability to be self-aware of who would I be, basically, if I wasn't... The person i am now which is made up of all sorts of things all my experiences including my autistic experience of the world mm. um and no i don't i wouldn't take that away from me um, i get the language mixed up about identity first person fair like i know what i mean but i don't necessarily say it <laughs> I don't know That's fine. It. yeah um I'm, i mean my like say in my blog i just say to be honest you don't really need to use the word autism at all if you scrap the word autism from your vocabulary, you never fall into the trap of using person first language then. Because I will always just talk about autistic experience or an autistic person or the autistic community. Like there's, there's very rarely a need, unless I'm educating, to use the word autism because it's abstract. It doesn't apply. It's applied, an abstract concept that's applied to real human beings who are very variable. Yeah, and it makes sense when you're talking about functioning as well. Like if you don't, if I don't tell someone there's that diagnosis, then those questions don't come up. But if I say, uh, yeah, what the, what the needs are, then it's more helpful. I yeah, it, it literally helps everybody much more than functioning lang language does. does. But what I wish for this world was there was more acceptance, you know, and I feel like I've used autism as a way to get people to accept, you know, like again coming back to that judgment from people like if i was to say to someone oh my daughter's not attending school well why and then it's well because she struggles to put a uniform on or she struggles to sleep at night or, or or whatever it is and and it's just that judgment and yeah as soon as i say oh she's autistic it's like oh okay <laughs> which is frustrating because it should be enough to say yeah those other things that you said without having to explain I mean, there's, for me, there's no issue in saying, obviously, that somebody's autistic. But I just think for all human beings, all children, it should be enough to just say they're struggling with X, Y and Z, so they're not coming in. Yeah, and this is something I know um, there's a lot of work going on for the curriculum. Um, but it's like I couldn't even say she was having a day off for mental health reasons, you know, or she'd feel anxious or she'd have a panic attack or there's nothing. 
no reason I could give. So it's, it just it just doesn't sit right with anyone when you say that you can't get your child to do something. There is an expectation as a parent, you do get your children. Yeah. You get them to eat, you get them to sleep, you get them to dress, you get them to leave the house and they do it whether they want to or not. And that's something that I really struggle with. But I think it doesn't shouldn't matter about a label, you know, a diagnosis that if they, you know, they can't do things, there's a reason for that. Or if they're not doing them, there is a reason. Um, yeah. And this is why, I mean, when I do, I do um, an event for children, um, and I think the youngest we did it with age rise was about eight years old. And I did it with a, a group of schools where, so they were all about 11 years plus, I think, where the majority of them were non-autistic neurotypical children there was a, a couple of um children in the group that were neurodivergent but we get all of them to write down what their strengths and challenges are to demonstrate everybody has strengths and challenges and sometimes people need regardless of whether they are neurodivergent or not to mm. be supported with something it shouldn't be this go-to is well there must be something wrong with you yeah oh yeah that's that what's wrong there's just no exceptions made. I've had it myself in work, you know. You, I, I would never want to say oh, I struggle with timekeeping as a teacher because no, you, you have to do that. And I find that, yeah, the school, and school should be a nurture in place. Yet as a teacher and as a mother, that hasn't been our experience, sadly, as a whole. Um, My timekeeping is terrible. I'm always <laughs> late for everything. That's why lockdown's good because I can literally just jump on a Zoom. Yeah. Oh yeah, my timekeeping is really, really poor. Um, but I'm also, I remember like I've had conversations about my children going to school and people presume that if they were told that school was optional, which many people think it's not, but for me, I was absolutely certain it was. Like I was always interested in home education. And I thought, oh, if, the, if it's an option, they're not gonna go. And people said that to me. Of course your child doesn't want to go to school you have to make them they have to go it's it's you know it's not an option um and i was really surprised when i told my daughter do you know what you're really struggling with school would you like to be home educated she said no <laughs> she never had an issue at school you know she did not want to go to school she loved school she loved it for the social side loved it for her friends and it just it, and, and that's what breaks my heart now is that she's no longer at school and it's just because those allowances. I think, is, again, yeah. that goes back to people assuming things about, like I said, with my basic um, participation cards and people mm. worrying that basically nobody would ever yeah. want to contribute in a seminar. But that doesn't happen. Mm. And it's the same. I bet even if you had a bunch of children that were like, yeah, no, I definitely don't want to go to school. I want to be off. They'll probably get bored after a while and actually ask to go back. Yeah, we found that with lockdown, there's quite a lot of kids who would much rather be in the classroom with their friends than doing it at home or, or not doing anything. You exactly. Know? So I think people underestimate children as well. And what they, they seem largely to be able to know instinctually what they need or want. They might mm. not be able to know how to get it or how to ask for it or necessarily what the thing actually is per se but um but yeah so these are just some examples of how different communities um or which communities that are more likely to use identity first which again it makes it nuanced and interesting and it's i think that's where the problem comes is that people use it as a blanket statement that you should just use person first language all the time but actually it depends on the community and then it depends on the individual which mm -hmm. is it's you know people have to work harder than just using blanket statements so again the deaf community um prefers identity first language with a capital d for deaf i use a capital a for autistic where um autism i don't because autism's a a, con a construct um and an abstract one at that mm. um lgbtq um ia community uses identity first language so again the individual would be a lesbian not a person with lesbianness <laughs> um, exactly so it sounds ridiculous doesn't it like you can separate it kind of thing um so person first so the down syndrome community typically prefers um person first language 
Um, and typically, again, it depends on who you're talking to, um, but those within mental health, um, I wouldn't class it as mental illness, um, prefer person first. So somebody has schizophrenia as opposed to um, they are a schizophrenic, for instance. But I don't even use the terminology like schizophrenia. I use the actual experiences of the individual. So they are a voice hearer, for instance, or they have um, visual hallucinations because that's much more yeah. accurate. It's, you know, schizophrenia as a term has got such um negative derogatory connotations whereas just talking about somebody as voice hearer is to the point and yeah. there's no hopefully no negative connotation and i like how you say attention differences as well i've never heard that before you said it it's because it's really hard to make adhd identity first yeah um and i have issues obviously with um uh, attention deficit and mm. disorder so yeah so i yeah i always say yeah when i'm referring to louis i say he has attention differences um, mm. whereas he's diagnosed with add without the hyper so he's got the inattentive yeah style or type or whatever yeah i'm told i'm add and yet my attention to some things is really high and others it's low so it's not the it nature isn't. of attention differences the hyper focus mm -hmm. on the things that you're actually interested in and that's the thing as well is the myth that people with attention differences have poor attention mm. and it's not ever as simple as that um, mm. it just simplifies things too much yeah absolutely um so important to remember like i said individual differences dependent on the community there might be differences in language um at this point in time this is kind of how i think of it I guess as well which is if you can't ask the individual because perhaps they're a child and they're not really understanding of the nuances of language um, I kind of guess I would go with the parents preference but I still I would model this is the thing that I would do as opposed to trying to force language and things onto people I do try to educate more about my preferences or just model it where I'll just keep saying yeah. I am an autistic person because I'm autistic, you know, and hopefully yeah. it will rub off on the other person or they get the hint. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, um, I don't know whether to correct people. I asked my daughter and she didn't really, she didn't really understand enough at this point. So, yeah, yeah. and exactly. It's, it's a very, it is a political thing. It is a, um, it's all about identity and things like that. And, and so children might not have that ability to consider those um, yeah nuances of language and i found this i know it's another subject really um or it's definitely going off on a tangent but i found that other people want to tell me that my daughter's asperger's which is not a title i've used and i didn't back when i was training either what i was told then is very different than what i know now but it's just not a term i use and yet people find it less offensive mm. less of a disorder less low function you know it's it's they prefer it so therefore want to tell me that that's what my child is and it's just these concepts just literally images. just explain to them that <laughs> it no longer exists in yeah. the main diagnostic manuals and so yeah. it shouldn't not to say that it's not but it shouldn't be being used as a diagnostic um mm. category anymore yeah. so it shouldn't be um, being diagnosed yeah and they're being inaccurate if they do that um you had a note about fostering positive autistic identity. Um, I would definitely suggest people um, purchase a video that Harry and I did where we really discussed the nuances of trying to foster a positive autistic identity, um, which is the link there. But mm -hmm. the main thing that um, we discuss in terms of fostering it is the difference between these two things. Um, mm. So I won't go into it in too much detail, but yeah there's there's the culture of autism in quotation marks which is very negative very much about pathology and everything that goes with it if those things like i said before if those things are used to describe you as a person mm -hmm. and how people behave towards you is based on this sort of understanding and this narrative the one on the left then how miserable and lonely and isolated um and depressed we become because nobody wants to be described this way and and it, it makes sense like you said before if your um, daughter was diagnosed at a point where she was really struggling you then tie the negative 
and then you assume that that label the diagnosis is the reason and that that's the only thing and it's this bad horrible thing that happened to you and if only I could get rid of it, et cetera, et cetera. But when you're having good days and you're not struggling, your support needs are being met, you're still autistic. Um, so it's trying to, ideally, in an ideal world, everybody would come to the understanding, the discovery that they are autistic when they're in a relatively good place. Mm. But that's not how things work at the moment. Like you say, your son, um, because he doesn't necessarily struggle um, or not, enough that that he would necessarily get a diagnosis um he's not tying his relatively low support needs to being autistic but he should because it's also why he's experiencing the world that he is if that makes sense um yeah. and so yeah it's all about fostering and becoming part of autistic culture so completely um scrapping as much as possible um the negative narrative of uh, the culture of autism um even like i said before even if you absolutely at your core being believe that to be autistic to be a person with autism means you have a disorder and a pathology um and you just won't ever believe anything as anything different i don't mean you personally because I, I know you don't think like this um but knowing that that culture of autism harms people mm. really should be enough for people to you know take on autistic culture instead because it improves well-being and we see it all the time and um, you know as soon as you get to be around autistic people and sharing in your experiences you're not isolated anymore um and you get to understand your autistic experiences and how to support them how to improve issues like burnout you even learn what burnout is you know you're not you don't necessarily learn autistic inertia and burnout and certainly not how to deal with it in a positive way within the culture of autism mm. you'll yeah. learn it from other autistic people in the autistic culture so hopefully there were some interesting things there for people um, that nicola has been able to ask of me today um, i have been dr chloe farahar of academy and i have had here nicola waitling so hopefully i've been pronouncing that correctly um, mm -hmm. asking me some of the questions that perhaps people would like to know but maybe never ask um like or or given you evidence for um if somebody asks you well you make eye contact so you can't be autistic so now you can thrust page 54 of the diagnostic manual at them um so thank you very much nicola for being on academy and having this conversation thank you chloe it's been really really interesting and helpful I appreciate your time and um, yeah, thank you. Thank you.